uh, again, my lecture is on combating the opioid epidemic, a very important topic um, given current, current uh, events. And so let's get right into it here. What is an opioid? An opioid is any drug or uh, chemical that produces pharmacological actions by interacting with neuronal cell membrane receptors in the spinal cord and the brain primarily. There are three receptor types. There's the mu, the kappa, and the delta receptors. Uh, you can see here in this illustration, as the opioid interacts with the receptor, there's a G-protein mediated downregulation of calcium uh, channels as well as uh, conversion of, uh, there's a downregulation of conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. Uh, the net effect of that is presynaptic inhibition of uh, neurotransmitter release. And this primarily occurs in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Uh, so this is a little bit esoteric. Uh, you know, there's uh, multiple subtypes of the delta kappa and mu receptors. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, the vast majority of them are, are in the brain and the spinal cord. There are some uh, peripheral receptors, but the majority of the effect of opioids uh, in terms of analgesia takes uh, place in the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, this illustration here to the right shows uh, kind of the classic ascending pain pathway where if you have a painful stimulus, the peripheral nerve uh, courses over to the spinal cord uh, and at the dorsal horn uh, synapses, uh, that then crosses over the midline and ascends up the spinal cord and brings the painful stimulus uh, to the uh, somatosensory portion of the uh, cortex. Uh, there's also a descending pathway that's a inhibitory or modulatory uh, pathway that uh, descends. And uh, in that case, opioids actually upregulate the descending pathway while they downregulate the ascending pathway. The main effects of opioids are analgesia. That is the main therapeutic uh, effect. Uh, there is reduction in consciousness, which uh, is useful uh, when used for uh, anesthesia purposes, um, although obviously it can be dangerous in cases of abuse. Uh, euphoria is uh, one of the main reasons why these are uh, abused, um, the euphoric effects that, that are characteristic of, of many opioids, and ultimately respiratory depression, which uh, is the reason uh, why uh, many people die from uh, abuse of opioids. Uh, just a point of distinction here, an opiate versus an opioid. An opiate is a naturally derived opioid uh, from the flowering opium poppy plant. Uh, the classic opiates are heroin, morphine, and codeine. Uh, opioid is kind of a more catch-all phrase. It's a broader term. It includes opiates, and it's any substance that binds to opioid receptors. So basically to those three receptor types that I uh, mentioned uh, a minute ago. Um, there uh, are natural opioids, uh, which are the opiates and there's the synthetic opioids. Synthetic opioid uh, examples are hydrocodone, oxycodone, fentanyl. These are drugs that we commonly use. Morphine is the benchmark to which all other opioids are compared to. And so that comes in useful uh, here in a couple minutes when we start um, trying to gauge how much we should be prescribing patients and some of the, uh, the new regulations that have come out, which uh, set forth guidelines in terms of uh, how much um, should be prescribed, uh, generally use morphine as the benchmark. So this uh, table here shows morphine uh, compared to some of the other intravenous uh, opioids such as fentanyl and, and Demerol. You can see that fentanyl is 100 times more potent than morphine. That'll be important later on when I talk about some of the, the uh, deaths that we've seen um, in patients at overdose. So morphine equivalent dosing, again, uh, morphine is the benchmark. So the patient's cumulative intake of any uh, drugs in the opioid class over a 24-hour period is expressed as morphine milligram equivalents, or MMEs. There's this nice app that the uh, CDC has put out, and it's available at the App Store, that basically you'll put in the medication that you're prescribing, the dosage, how many tablets you're, uh, you're indicating the patient should be taking on a daily basis or what the maximum number of tablets they should be taking. Uh, 
uh, and this will tell you what the MME total is. So it helps guide appropriate opioid therapy and prevent overdosing. And here you can see uh, this is the, the app. Uh, it's called CDC Opioid Guideline. This table here shows um, morphine compared to other oral uh, opioids. So you can see here that hydrocodone, which is a common opioid that's uh, prescribed uh, for uh, post-operative uh, pain management, has pretty much the same potency as morphine. It's a one-to-one. -one. Uh, oxycodone is a bit more potent, 1.5 to one. So typically patients uh, will uh, ask, patients that ask for oxycodone specifically, it kind of raises a red flag at times. Uh, tramadol, which is a, a less potent opioid, is only about 10% the potency of uh, morphine, while codeine, another, another weak opioid, is, is about 15% uh, the potency of uh, morphine. An important note, codeine and tramadol in children. Uh, this started off as a black box warning that was put out by the FDA uh, in 2013. It is... Uh, it has been refined over the last few years and it is now contraindicated under age 12. Um, it's also contraindicated in patients 12 to 18 post tonsillectomy. And the reason for that is because tonsillectomy will produce some airway edema. And so these patients will then be predisposed to potential airway obstruction uh, under you know, the effects of a sedative type of drug. Uh, and this also goes for patients with obstructive sleep apnea or patients that are obese. The reason uh, for this is there's this enzyme in the liver, uh, cytochrome P2D6, which in some children uh, that are ultra rapid metabolizers will result in a quick metabolism of these drugs. Well, unfortunately, tramadol and codeine both have active metabolites. So when they break down, the drugs, the, the chemicals that they break down to are also active opioids. So in the case of tramadol, it breaks down to O-desmethyl tramadol and codeine breaks down into morphine. So in these kids that are ultra rapid metabolizers, these drugs are quickly being metabolized into another opioid that's also active. And so these, uh, these children can have uh, uh, profound sedation and uh, can die from uh, respiratory depression and airway obstruction. Um, in children that require long-term chronic pain therapy, uh, there is genetic testing that can determine if uh, they uh, have this ultra-rapid uh, phenotype. So now that we have that, um, behind us. Uh, let's get on with the actual problem at hand. This is uh, uniquely an American problem. Unfortunately, our country uh, prescribes and uses uh, more opioids than any other country in the world. Um, how did we get here? Well, in the late 90s, pharmaceutical companies uh, such as Purdue Pharmaceuticals, uh, which uh, produces ox OxyContin, uh, made a huge push, uh, hired hired a bunch of salespeople, a bunch of sales reps, uh, train them really well, um, and you know, wine and dined all their physicians and gave reassurance that these drugs were non-addictive. At the same time, uh, the American Pain Society, uh, along with some other physician groups, uh, made a push to treat pain more aggressively. They referred to it as the, the uh, fifth vital sign. So this was kind of a convergence or a perfect storm of events that uh, resulted in, in where we are now. So uh, what do we know? Well, 21 to 29% of patients prescribed opioids for chronic pain, which is not typically what we uh, treat patients for, uh, end up misusing them. Uh, eight to 12% develop an opioid use disorder and four to six percent of those that misuse them uh, transition to heroin. I thought this was a pretty eye-opening statistic. Eighty percent of those that use heroin started with prescription opioids. Uh, and the source for these for this data is from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Um, opioid overdoses increased by thirty percent between July 2016 and September 2017 in 45 states. 
uh, in the Midwest, uh, overdoses increased by 70%. Opioid overdoses in large cities and in 16 different states increased by 54%. This data here from the CDC uh, indicates that more than 40 people die every day from uh, opioid overdoses. Uh, this shows that in 2015, we had 52,400 overdoses, and that was an 11% increase from 2014. Well, one year later in 2016, that number increased to 64,000. You can see how that overshadowed uh, all these other types of uh, accidental deaths. Um, and then in 2017, that number increased even further significantly to 70,000 uh, overdose deaths. 28,000 deaths involved fentanyl or similar uh, fentanyl analogs. Uh, so I'll show here in just a couple minutes uh, where that's uh, become a problem. This graph here shows the deaths per 100,000 population. Um, you can see how it's, it's just skyrocketed uh, between 2000 and 2016. I know we're all kind of burned out on seeing uh, graphs uh, by the CDC out these days, but there's no flattening this curve. This has really uh, increased uh, rapidly. And it's everywhere. Uh, lots, lots of these cases in West Virginia and in the southwestern part of Virginia. Uh, but it's really, really everywhere. Um, and it's right here in our backyard. This was a case uh, in the eastern part of the state uh, from last year. And it also hits home. On this fall day, several came together to remember a young life taken by addiction. I never knew I could miss someone so much, feel such sorrow, experience such heartache. 24-year-old Taylor Groh died in October from a heroin overdose. Just two years earlier, some of the same mourners attended the funeral of 21-year-old Adam Abubakar. For Adam's father, the loss is immeasurable. When you lose a child, you're wounded, almost mortally. And you have to dig into uh, yourself for survival mode. And, and my survival mode is to find a reason to live. And, and for me, uh, it's to advocate. That's it, take your time. As an oral surgeon, Omar Abubakar has been teaching students at VCU School of Medicine for 25 years. But the tragic death of his son and the harsh reality of an epidemic that has now been declared a public health crisis in Virginia have changed his focus. And that opioid addiction, uh, I hate to say this, but we're part of it. According to the CDC, opiates, primarily pain relievers and heroin, are the reason overdose deaths have quadrupled since the year 2000. In the Commonwealth, at least two Virginians die from an opiate overdose every day. In many cases, it begins with a prescription. It was a routine pain prescription for a shoulder injury that Abu Bakr says eventually led his son to heroin. In the United States, we consume 99% of the medication of the narcotics that manufacture for pain medicine. The rest of the world consume 1%. They're taking the drug to feel normal. It's why Abu Bakr has become a driving force at VCU to add addiction awareness to the curriculum for thousands of dental, nursing, and med students. There's a lot more responsibility on us as providers to not only alleviate our patients' pain, but to do that responsibly. Abu Bakr points to a trend in the 1990s when medical organizations began issuing new pain treatment guidelines. By 2001, healthcare providers and hospitals were required to ensure their patients received appropriate pain treatment. In some cases, doctors were found liable for not meeting patient expectations. 15 years later, researchers say the vast majority of American doctors are overprescribing pain pills. Habits and behaviors as physicians and dentists that we have developed over the years uh, as to patient prescriptions and narcotics that we have to overcome to do the right thing. Abu Bakr says it's been difficult, even painful at times, to share his son's story. But the personal sacrifice, he says, is worth it if it saves another life 
and spares another parent the heartbreak of burying a child. What would Adam say? Oh, well, say his friends. One of the friends that he didn't have. Uh, uh, I think he would want me to do this. After his son's death, Dr. Abubakar went back to school to earn a certificate so he could teach about addiction. VCU also recently joined the ranks of 59 other medical schools and took a pledge to make addiction awareness a priority in the curriculum. In the newsroom, I'm Tracy Sears. It's hard to watch. Um, really gut-wrenching. Dr. Abubakar, a mentor of mine throughout dental school and residency and Tremendous loss. Um, well, as Dr. Abubakar said, uh, you know, dentistry and medicine uh, clearly have been huge contributors to the problem. Um, and, you know, according to this study, uh, dentistry contributed 28.9% of uh, opioids that were prescribed. Uh, other studies show a little bit less in the 13 to 15% range, but still a high, high number. Uh, this study from the University of Pennsylvania uh, revealed that more than half of the opioids that are prescribed to patients following uh, tooth extractions or wisdom tooth re uh, removal were unused. So what happens to these drugs? Well, they end up out in the wrong hands. They, they end up being abused, um, as this uh, next segment shows. Morning from the Surgeon General. He's sounding the alarm this week to doctors about the epidemic of opioid abuse in the U.S. And for so many teens, addiction can all begin with a dental procedure. That's something of a rite of passage. NBC News national correspondent Kate Snow explains in our new series, Hooked. It's just primarily mom. At just 27, Brittany Ringerson runs Lighthouse Recovery in Delray Beach, Florida. Clean for seven years now. It's how she got here that might surprise you. Was it a doctor who gave you your first painkiller? It was. It was a dentist. A dentist? A dentist. Like so many teenagers, she had her wisdom teeth pulled at 16 and was sent home with a 30-day supply of Percocet. Then came the day where... I, I took the pills off the shelf behind the stuffed animal that I'd hid them behind and proceeded to take them. And she quickly moved on to stronger opioids. I learned I could smoke them. And then my life forever changed. What do you wish now? You know, even what you know now. I wish that the dentist would have talked to my parents about potential consequences. A recent study in the Journal of the American Medical Association found after a tooth extraction, 61% of 14 to 17 year olds walked out with the prescription. Dr. Paul Moore at the University of Pittsburgh is spearheading an effort to get dentists and dental students to change how they prescribe. We need to stop and say, no, wait. Moore says for about half of patients, over-the-counter pain relievers are enough. Many patients who have the wisdom teeth taken out never need or require Vicodin or Percocet or any of those opioids. Ashley Funkenberry told her dentist she was an addict, but says he insisted on giving her the opioid fentanyl last year when she had her wisdom teeth out. And I relapsed. So was it a trigger? Yes. What did it feel like to have that fentanyl? It's like a relief, like a like an overpowering relief. Ashley is in recovery again at Lighthouse, but Brittany wants dentists to understand the impact they have. I think the dentists need to hold themselves accountable to a higher level of practice. Dentists now trying to change so young versus first painkiller doesn't lead to a whole lot more. It's now NBC News, Del Rage for. So where do all these extra pills end up? Well, they get abused in, in many cases. Um, kids have these farm parties. Uh, when parents go out of town, they'll, everyone will bring whatever's in the medicine cabinet and throw it in a big bowl and they just you know, start popping pills. Um, what happens is this cycle of abuse uh, where they start off with things like hydrocodone and oxycodone and these are at least when this slide was made, these were the street values. So, you know, a young person that may not have a lot of money starts running out of money pretty quickly, and then they naturally will progress over to uh, heroin uh, at a much lower cost.
Um, what I was mentioning earlier about fentanyl, um, a huge problem uh, is that uh, fentanyl is now being uh, uh, made in clandestine uh, laboratories, uh, a lot of it in China, and it's being mixed in with the heroin. And given that fentanyl is, is much, much more potent than, than uh, morphine or heroin, it's, it's 100 times more potent than morphine, 50 times more uh, potent than heroin, uh, has resulted in a lot of these overdose deaths because the, the user is not necessarily aware that there's fentanyl or even some of these other even more potent analogs of fentanyl that are mixed into to the heroin. Uh, this just shows how some of it makes its way into our country, uh, you know, either directly or indirectly. Um, and then a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of infectious diseases are, are on the rise uh, due to uh, needle use, um, you know, HIV, hepatitis, endocarditis. Uh, so if, if the patient, if, if these people aren't dying, uh, you know, they're, they're developing these other uh, diseases. Um, this article by Dr. Fauci, who's, who's become a little bit of a cult hero uh, these days. Uh, but, you know, if these patients don't, uh, don't die, their, their lives are still, you know, ruined. I mean, look at these kids. Um, a lot of them are athletes that get injured, um, you know, playing sports and they end up getting opioids and, and that's how they start. Um, well, what can we do? Uh, a lot of it's, you know, a lot of the legwork and the heavy lifting has been done for us uh, by the legislature, by, by the medical and dental boards. Uh, now that we have to follow certain guidelines, but there's a lot of things above and beyond that that we should and, and can be doing in order to curb the the, the number of opioid uh, prescriptions that are, that are given out. Um, quickly, uh, going through the Virginia uh, Department of Health uh, regulations, and these are certainly available on their website, uh, but uh, this uh, statute pertains to acute pain. So this would be the, the patient that would be coming into your office, uh, you know, with a toothache. You haven't treated that patient yet. Uh, clearly, a non-opioid uh, shall be given consideration prior to treatment with opioids. Um, you know, you should uh, monitor them in the prescription monitoring program, uh, especially if they're exhibiting, you know, potential signs of drug-seeking behavior. Uh, you should conduct an assessment of the patient's history and risk of substance abuse. That's as simple as uh, just having in your medical history form a question of, uh, you know, whether that patient has ever had problems with substance abuse. Um, if a prescription for an opioid is given, it should not exceed seven days. And again, this is for someone that's just come in and you're just treating the pain. You're not you're not performing a procedure uh, to alleviate the pain. Um, and you should not exceed 50 MMEs per day. If, and this is according to the regs, if you're going to exceed 120 MMEs per day, you should refer that patient to a pain management specialist, um, and that should be documented. Um, if that patient is gonna is already on a benzodiazepine or you're giving a benzodiazepine, then a prescription for naloxone or Narcan is indicated. This is um, the medicine that uh, Maynard Phelps talked about. Um, in his case, it was for someone that had a, a narcotic overdose. It's available in a nasal spray and an auto injector. This is much like an EpiPen. Um, this just continues to talk about you know, the need to document uh, and the need to check their history in the PMP. Uh, you should document the description of the pain, the diagnosis. Uh, that way there's justification for giving the opioid. Uh, and of course, document your exam. Um, this is for chronic pain. We're not really treating patients for chronic pain. Basically, they need to be referred to a chronic pain management uh, specialist if, if the pain is ongoing um, and not able and not amenable to 
whatever treatment modality you're offering them. This is uh, pertaining to C uh, credits, two hours every two years. Uh, so this certainly qualifies for that. Um, this portion here does not apply as long as the opioid is being prescribed to a patient as part of a treatment uh, for a surgical or invasive procedure and such prescription is for no more than 14 consecutive days. So uh, once you do perform a definitive procedure, you are able to, to give a prescription, but it should not exceed 14 days. Uh, the CDC recommendations, uh, these are, you know, a lot of this is repetitive. Um, some of this doesn't apply to us. Opioids are not the first line therapy. That clearly applies to us. Uh, discuss risks and benefits, just as that young lady, uh, you know, eloquently stated in her uh, interview, you know, if a, you know, if you're prescribing an opioid, you know, you should mention to the parents uh, and to the patient really that they can be habit forming. Uh, and so clearly try to, discourage them from using this as their first line of treatment. Uh, immediate release versus uh, continuous release opioids are clearly favored. The lowest effective dose or the least potent opioid uh, would be where you would want to start. Uh, short durations, again, we really shouldn't be prescribing for more than seven days. Use risk mitigation strategies. That goes along with the uh, prescribing of Narcan. Uh, if, if a patient is at high risk, uh, review their PMP data, uh, avoid, con or again, concurrent benzodiazepine prescribing, but a lot of these patients are already on benzos. Uh, you know, a lot of people are on Xanax for anxiety, so um, you got to make sure you check their medication history because you may be uh, inadvertently putting them at risk by giving them an opioid. Uh, Some of the strategies, um, again, reduce the quantity and potency of opioids prescribed. Um, you wanna start with ibuprofen, uh, ideally four to 600 milligrams, uh, and typically I'll have them alternate uh, at three hour intervals with acetaminophen. Preemptive analgesia has been shown to work. Uh, that's when the patient uh, initiates, uh, you know, their non-steroidal an hour before uh, surgery or treatment. Uh, and then incremental dosing of opioids if necessary for breakthrough pain. Keep in mind the maximum dose of acetaminophen is 4,000 milligrams per day and ibuprofen is 3,200 milligrams per day. Uh, you know, we try to use a multimodal approach of uh, pain management uh, where we're using non anti-inflammatory drugs and, and local anesthesia and acetaminophen. Uh, we use a lot of ketamine uh, with our IV sedations, which is also uh, has analgesic properties that are centrally acting. Uh, and of course, if necessary, judicious use of opioids, but only if necessary. This study shows how uh, ibuprofen with acetaminophen has a much more effective uh, decrease in pain intensity over a period of time compared to uh, codeine with acetaminophen, which is this green uh, line here. Some of the strategies as far as prescribing, prescribe them after treatment has been rendered. Uh, so don't give it to them beforehand because uh, you know, they may not come back. Uh, prescribe them in, seven, in small quantities, again, less than seven days ideally. Uh, use the lowest effective dose. Uh, E-prescribing, uh, which we have piloted in the past, it can be a little bit cumbersome. There's a lot of friction. Uh, uh, there's uh, two-factor authentication, so it's, it's not really as easy as it, as it could be. Uh, but that was originally uh, supposed to be state law in July of this year. More than likely that will be delayed. Um, and you know, explain these guidelines to a patient. That's always a nice way to, to get out of having, a, you know, having to prescribe some of these drugs to a patient that's insisting, you know, let them know that there's there's state laws that you have to abide by. And, and that's actually been 
really effective uh, compared to before we had some of these guidelines. Again, uh, alternative modalities, local anesthetic, topical medicaments. Uh, if a patient has a dry socket, you know, you can pack it with uh, topical medicine and that usually takes care of it. They usually don't need an opioid. Uh, steroids work sometimes. Antibiotics, if a patient has pain resulting from an infection, then the antibiotic will help resolve that pain or improve it to where just, uh, you know, again, a, a ibuprofen should be all they need. Uh, until that inf that tooth is definitively treated, and then uh, Expirel is a medicine. I'll uh, this will um, be the the last part of my talk here is uh, Expirel, which is an excellent uh, modality that we've been using. It's an adjunct. It's basically uh, liposomal bupivacaine. Um, it's administered by infiltration. It's only it's not approved for nerve block in in our uh, indications that we would be using it for, at least not yet. It looks like they're uh, expecting approval for nerve block this year. Uh, but it provides analgesia for about 72 hours. Uh, so it uses this depot foam uh, technology where uh, it's this multivesicular uh, liposome. It's got all these little tiny bubbles and each one of those contains bupivacaine. Um, a 20 ml vial uh, contains about 740 million liposomes. So it's, it's, um, it's pretty amazing what they can do. So these little vesicles will basically pop uh, as, you know, as the liposome breaks down and, and release the uh, bupivacaine that they contain. You can see here how there's a peak here at about 24 to 48 hours. Um, of the bupivacaine and then that gradually tapers off. Uh, so there's still detectable bupivacaine 96 hours later, but uh, most of the analgesic effect uh, usually uh, tapers off at about 72 hours. It's a very safe drug. Uh, they've done uh, cardiac uh, safety studies. There's no QT interval prolongation, no evidence of any cardiac events. Uh, really the only adverse reaction which uh, I, don't, I haven't seen many of is nausea, uh, vomiting, and constipation. Certainly opioids have uh, much more severe side effects. Uh, it's administered by infiltration technique. Um, in the maxilla, usually two injections in the mandible along the buccinator attachment, usually three to four uh, small uh, points of infiltration. 